Welcome to Off Hours, a conversation between John Edwards and Chris Manning. Today's episode, we have uh, another special guest joining us. A few years ago, we had the pleasure of having Peter speak on to talk a little bit about his history as well as the Naked Watchmaker, which was his new project that he was uh, he was working on at the time. And we're delighted to have on Daniela Marin, who is the other half of the Naked Watchmaker and uh, probably the the lesser known half of the, the Naked Watchmaker. Uh, she's here to discuss where the Naked Watchmaker has gone in the last few years since we spoke to Peter, as well as to discuss a little bit about um, the history from the other side of the Speak Marin collaboration, as well as the new masterclass. So please sit down and enjoy. This is a wonderful conversation. We're very thankful for Daniela to uh, join us. And as always, we have links to everything we discuss in the show notes. Daniela Marin, welcome to the show. Thank you. Nice to be here. Now, typically when we have a, a guest here on Off Hours, we like to, to lay a bit of, of groundwork, a bit of history for the listeners so that uh, they can have a chance to, to get to know you and, and where you're coming from and, uh, and your, your background. Now, unlike Peter Speak, uh, who we uh, had the pleasure of chatting with here on the, the show a number of years ago, he's, he's quite a, a public figure within the industry and uh, as the other half of uh, the, the founding members of the Peter Speak Marin brand, the, you are the Marin in Speak Marin. A whole lot less is, is known about you. Yeah, it's true. It's true. I am the Marin in the Speak Marin. I, it's true. V- very little is known about me, and that was deliberately done at the at the time. I was happy to run the company and to concentrate on building up Peter's um, public persona. At the time when uh, when we started the company. There were a lot of CEOs really pushing themselves instead of the brand. And then, of course, they'd leave the brand and then go somewhere else. And it was confusing. And I just decided that I needed to build Speak Marin. And the way I was going to do it was by concentrating on the watchmaker and not the person that's running the company, the commercial side, and to put that forward. And so... The approach at the time, because I had literally a 20-year plan um, with all of the watches we would be making, Uh, we sat down with Peter and we split it all up and we had all the models, everything we would be doing and the way we would be approaching it. And at the beginning, the, the whole idea was we build the brand, we build the persona, and then we pull the persona back and we let the brand be the brand. Um, so that was the strategy behind it. And I was really so busy with uh, promoting the company and finding retailers and just doing everything. I mean, at one stage, I was doing the shipping. I was doing everything. And slowly we, we, we brought on um, a few people to help us. Um, but at the beginning, it was literally Peter and myself. Yeah. It was a lot of work. And for me, I didn't want the media to be concentrating on anything other than master watchmaker and brand because that's what i was selling and really at the time you were you were starting speak marin sort of in a a golden age of independent watchmakers who were starting to come into their own and people were becoming more and more aware of these independent watchmakers as individuals as opposed to anonymous people within larger brands as well so it really did work well with the sort of the time that that you were starting this brand. Exactly. And and for us, it was a matter of that we needed to really have a solid foundation. And that solid foundation revolved around the watchmaker. And the funny thing is, is that it was just the two of us. And I remember when we sold the first watch and I said to Peter, oh, my God, it's sold. <laughs> And I was like, oh, that's great. And I was like, I have no idea how to ship <laughs> to another country. <laughs> and at the time, Peter was like, well, you know, you're, you're, you're doing the commercial side. So call uh, Philippe's wife. We, we, and Philippe is Philippe Dufour. Uh, sure. Call Philippe's wife and ask her. Because a lot of the wives actually helped 
I still do help in, in a lot of these little brands. Um, so I was on the phone trying to get as much information as quickly as possible to, to make sure this timepiece and made it across um, to the other side of the world and didn't get stuck in customs. Sure. I had to learn a lot straight away, especially when it came to things like uh, crocodile straps and all those, mm-hmm. all those things that are, can be very, very complicated. Yeah, and to the layperson, you might think you just throw something in a, in a FedEx box and, and ship it off, but that, that is not the case no. uh, when, it, when it comes to <laughs> high-value items, and particularly items with animal parts in them, yes. like a, a crocodile watch strap. There are all sorts of regulations uh, around shipping those. There are, and each country is different. And that's the, mm-hmm. that's the thing. If, if everybody did the same thing, then you've learned it once and that's it. But uh, each country is different. And in some cases, you've got to have a license. You have to have a license to import. Yeah. Even though you are not in that country. Um, so that was, that was a real challenge. Um, the funny thing is, we just got on with it and we just did mm. it. And, and uh, you know, one country at a time, we discovered them all. And um, it was a really exciting time. And as I said, the, now I look back on it, the the concept of phoning Philip Dufour's wife and saying, hey, <laughs> can you give me a hand? And so many of us were starting all at the mm. same time. Oh, it was such a magical time that you, you entered the, the industry and broke onto the, the independent scene. It was, it was. And the funny thing was that, you know, I came to Switzerland uh, from London and uh, that this story kills people, uh, especially the Swiss, because I worked in London uh, for the BBC and I worked in the heart of London. I went from central London to Le Loc. That that's a uh, a massive culture shift. <laughs> it was, it was, it was just. But it was exciting because I, you know, Switzerland was never on my list of countries to live, um, or or and it was just like okay, well, I'm I'm moving there. I'm going to start a new life there, and everything was exciting. And the concept of having so much snow, you know, being around so <laughs> in London, it snows for one week. And and that's and everything grinds to a halt and and that's mm. it. Then it's gone. I remember the the first uh, the first winter in the lot when the snow poles went up. Oh, I was so excited. It was September, and I expected okay the snow poles were up, so there's going to be snow. It's going to be like next week maybe. And uh, of course there was no snow for a while, and then it started snowing. And it didn't stop. And no, I remember <laughs> I remember saying to this lady, um, because I was trying to integrate and I joined a, a ladies group and I needed to learn French as well. And I remember saying to, to the lady, oh, you know, um, when does the snow go? Uh, because it had been like a couple of weeks and the snow was still there. So it was like, when does it go? And they looked at me and they said, oh, maybe June. And I was just like, (laughs) are you kidding? (laughs) And uh, they were like, yes, yes, it depends on the winter. June, it'll be definitely gone. Uh, And I was like, June, I expect heat. (laughs) You know, I expect shorts in June. And it was it was hilarious. And just learning about the different life and the law learned things, things that you just don't see in other countries that don't have that much snow. And it's a very different culture. It was incredible. And at the time, you know, um, when I arrived, I got to know a whole new group of people um, that uh, that worked with Peter. You know, I met a bunch of uh, Dutch guys. Amongst them were Tim and Buck Grenefeld, clearly Stephen Forsey, who we knew from London anyway. Mm-hmm. Then meeting the other, the rest of the team from Renault and Pappy. You know, at the time they were in Australia. The other guys that were not in Renault and Pappy but were in the area were, um, there was Stepan uh, Sapernova and uh, the McGonagall's, and gosh, who else? Um, a few others. Oh, and some guy called Kari Butelainen. Um, <laughs> Who's he? And, I haven't heard that name before. <laughs> you know, I remember going to his house, 
because we were we were living at the time we were living in um in a farm i had i i dreamt of living in a farm uh converted a farm or barn i was just like that said i'm going to find a converted a barn and and we're going to move in and i found it and um and so we moved into this amazing amazing farmhouse just on the outskirts of lala i remember um the McGonagall's turning up and uh, at the time it, I didn't have kids and uh, they were saying, oh, we're going to go and visit Carrie. I think Carrie was was teaching at Worcester at the time. Mm-hmm. And it was like, yeah, yeah, he's the Worcester, one of the Worcester teachers and the, um, he's made a watch. And this was considering that these are all watchmakers. OK, now I'll give you a I'll set a scene in every single watchmaker's house there is a shrine it's a room okay that is visited when visitors come and inside is a bench okay where they will one day build their watch (laughs) and every single apartment every single house has it and i remember just and i used to joke with with the the other wives and girlfriends was just like oh here's the shrine yeah, it's gathering <laughs> dust. Nothing's happening. And it's just like, you might as well just replace it. Put some, Use this room. Use it for something. And, of course, it, they uh, the McGonagall's turned up, and it was just like, yeah, we're going to go visit Carrie. And I was like, oh, yes, we're going to go visit another shrine. <laughs> we get to Carrie's uh, house. I'd never met Carrie before, you know, said hello to his wife and – it was um, very nice. I was really, really taken aback by Carrie's um, Carrie's living room because at the time he had this uh, clock, literally like a turret clock, that he had converted into a table. And it was amazing. It was the wildest thing I'd ever seen. And I just thought it was so, so, um, I mean, it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. It was fantastic. Glass top, and it was a table. It was like a coffee table. Of course, they they go off to the shrine, and uh, Carrie pulls out from a drawer a wristwatch. And uh, there's Stephen McGonagall. I think John was there as well. And they're all going, oh, oh. There was a lot of oh, and ooh, and ahs going on. And, there, and there's me thinking, at last, one of them has done something. <laughs> something here and they show me the watch and i was like oh yeah okay you made a watch okay that's one where's the rest it's yeah the the first one is challenging it's the the second one is is really really difficult it's it's (laughs) always it's always more difficult to get that second one out i remember him pulling it out of a pulling it out of a drawer and uh and it was being shown around but he was still at was step at the time I don't think this is a, a timepiece that, uh, uh, you know, carried his name or anything like that it was a commercial piece. It was just a something that Carrie had knocked up. And it was, that you know, the whole the whole little community was buzzing about that Carrie had made his own watch. Now, to say this is, you know, when I met Peter, uh, he was in restoration and he, he we would be going through markets and things and he would be buying up old pieces and sometimes he'd come across cases and and he'd be putting together, you know, a movement, a dial and a case, he'd marrying it all up and every single event, every single special event, Christmas, birthday, you name it, he would be, uh, he'd come up with this little this little bag or a little box and he'd be so excited and he'd, he'd give me this box. This was my gift. And at the beginning, it was just like, oh, what could it be? And I opened it up and it was a watch that he had just not, you know, put together. And, um, and it was like, oh, this, it was so exciting. But then every single gift was always a watch that he'd put together. And I remember one day him handing, you know, he was so excited and he shows me this little beautiful little pouch and uh, and uh, he's like, guess what it is? And I looked at him and I said, it's a watch. And he was like, 
how did you guess? <laughs> and it was like, I guess that's the only thing <laughs> you ever gave me. And he was just like, really? <laughs> and it was, it was really funny. And it was, um, it was one of those things that will always say with me. In the end, all of those watches we ended up um, selling. We put them yeah. into auction, and that was that was one of the one of the ways that uh, we started up buying the machines for him hmm. to make his watch, the foundation watch. Right, and a really, really, <laughs> I I don't know if he's ever told you anybody the story, but we were living in the barn house, and uh, the only room in the house that had tiled floors was our bedroom. And uh, I decided because I was really tired of living in La Loc and I needed I needed something. And I decided to start a long distance MBA. And I received my first box of books. And at the time it was videotapes. <laughs> That's how long ago it was. And uh, from the Open University. And I was so excited. And we part of this um, this this house also had a studio apartment. So I literally took over the studio apartment. That was where I was going to study. And Peter was very excited and very happy that I was, you know, I found some excitement back in my life because Lolok can be a little bit plain if you're not a watchmaker. I remember I was putting all my things away and he, he looked at me and he said, what am I going to do? You're going to be busy with this. What am I going to do? And I said to him, well, why don't you go and make that watch you're always talking about? I said, because really, you know, I'm going to be busy. So get on with it. And uh, and he was like, OK, I'm going to do it. And so at that point, he announces that his workshop is going to be our bedroom and that we <laughs> had to move. <laughs> and it was we had a spare room. So everything got shifted to the spare room and our bedroom got converted into his workshop and he started working on on the foundation watch and it was uh, an incredible an incredible journey but i remember just the whole thing of every single watchmaker that was there would be talking about the day they made their watch and eventually i say 80% of them did which was which was great and the funny mm-hmm. thing was that they were all they were all thinking about it at the same time and they were all being so yeah. mysterious and, you know, hush, hush, I'm not going to tell you. And it was just so, it was so comical because, you know, they're like, oh, I'm working on a project. And, I, and I'd be like, mm, let oh, me really? guess, mm. let me think, what could it possibly be? And I remember the day when I, I met up with um, some of the wives. I didn't actually meet up with them much because – most of them had children and and I really wasn't that interested in having children at that point in my life. And the conversations tended to revolve around uh, babies and and it was just like, oh, and the, the inevitable question was, when are you going to have children? And uh, and I was really sick of that question. And um, so <laughs> I just stopped, you know, meeting up with them. And this was one case where I did go. We were all in a restaurant and uh, uh, Phoebe Fawcett was there. And she was just so, so excited about something. At the time, uh, everyone was like, what's going on? What's going on? And she was like, I can't tell you. I can't tell you. It's a secret. I can't tell you. I've been sworn to secrecy. And it was hilarious because um, it was so obvious that Stephen would be would be starting up on his own. And the funny thing was that Peter was already working on his uh, on his pocket watch. It was exactly pretty much at the same time, and uh, it was just an incredible an incredible time. The McGonagalls clearly went uh, and did their thing uh, much later, but uh, and Stepan went back to um, his home country. The funny thing was that we didn't actually. I didn't realize that Stepan comes from a line of oh, his father is a famous designer, jewelry designer. Hmm. Until I went to uh, I don't know, one of our friends' uh, ho- homes and uh, I see a magazine 
that it's open up and it's an article on Stepan. And I look at them and I say, why is there an article? Why is Stepan in this magazine? And that's when uh, our Finnish friends basically said, oh, you don't realize, but Stepan's father is um, was, because he had passed away, uh, was an extremely famous uh, jewelry designer. Mm. And, uh, and she said, to give you an example of how famous every single jewelry store in the country will have one piece. Um, wow. uh, that he has designed. It was extraordinary because, you know, he had never mentioned, he never mentioned anything. And he was just, you know, part of, part of the gang, hmm. part of the, at, at the time. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a crazy magical time. Uh, Vianney had already set up. Some of these guys worked for Vianney at the time. And I remember visiting, um, I don't know if you, you are in the Saint Croix, where Vianney has his workshop. There's also a guy called uh, François Junot, mm -hmm. and he makes automatas. Mm -hmm. And they are extraordinary. And I visited there with, um, I think it was Stephen McGonagall and Peter. We went to, and had a look because... Um, Stephen's brother was uh, was working there, and we went and had a look around. And at the time, Francois Junot was making uh, a piece that had been commissioned by a coffee company in the area, and it was a guy on a flying carpet, and he had the skeleton of the of the carpet that he was working on at the time. And of course, this workshop has all manner of things, limbs and all sorts of things, you know, like puppet limbs and everything that, that was used for, for all the creation. It was the most extraordinary, extraordinary um, experience. And I have to say, at the time, um, I remember having the conversation uh, with Peter with regards to uh, watches or, or automatas. And, uh, and at the time, I remember saying, I like watches, but... Really, I love automatas. <laughs> and uh, and today I have to say that I do like automatas still and they are they are extraordinary. But my my passion has definitely uh, switched to the watches. So what would you say is one of your earliest memories of, of a mechanical wristwatch? My my earliest memory, full stop, is um actually as a young child very young and it's a strange memory and people have said to me that can't be your memory but it is i remember my father putting his wristwatch next to my ear and hearing the ticking hmm. and just being blown away by this this ticking sound i never actually thought anything of it because I just thought this is the kind of thing that, you know, parents do to get a reaction to see a toddler's face when when they realize that there's something that they can't explain. And that was uh, that was something that only now as an adult, you know, really and considering what I do, that I realized mm. how how incredibly pertinent that was, that that was mm. that was the first thing that marked me was the ticking of of his wristwatch. And my father, um, who's put, um, passed away now, um, his his motto in life was that you must always have a good wristwatch and a good pair of shoes. Mm -hmm. Everything else came secondary, but you must always have a good wristwatch. And for him, a good wristwatch was a Swiss watch. <laughs> that was his definition of a good mm. wristwatch. <laughs> So, so that was my first experience, really. Later on, I didn't really, I had, I had a wristwatch because my father made sure we all had a, a Swiss wristwatch. Um, but I didn't really um, make a purchase. In fact, this is going to sound incredible, but I've only ever purchased one watch. And that was in the later days of um, my mother's life when um, she had uh, severe Parkinson's, uh, but she would never go without her watch. Um, but of course, with the shaking, 
she would uh, struggle to put it on. And uh, I remember asking her, uh, you know, what, what would you like? And she said to me, oh, the only thing I miss is my watch. I, I like to have my watch. And she said, but I can't, um, I can't fasten it. So I literally, and I was living uh, in Switzerland, and uh, I literally left the house, went to the local jewelers, and I said, I just need, I need an automatic watch that has um, a bracelet, but an a, one with the elasticated um, sort of effect. So she can just slip it in and out. And mm. I can't, for the life of me, I can't remember what it was. It wasn't anything, you know, to write home about. But the important thing was that it was important to her. Mm. And that she had the autonomy of putting it on herself and taking it off. Mm. And that was literally the only wristwatch that I bought. I've made a lot of watches, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, at the time people would say, oh, you know, what watches do you buy? Well, you know, I have a safe full of watches. I'm not <laughs> yes. going to be buying any watches. That was the, that was the most poignant part. But, mm. you know, the, the, one of the nicest memories was um, the, those timepieces that Peter put together for me. They were, mm -hmm. they were, that was, you know, a great a great memory the really i've seen so many amazing timepieces that it's hard to put your finger on it but the one piece that did actually just blow my mind was during these later years uh, with the naked watchmaker where i was on social media and somebody posted oh and i can't remember the reference but it's a Breguet will be in and it's quite modern and I remember just seeing this picture and my jaw dropping and just not breathing <laughs> this is not at all a rational reaction um, but this was just like wow this this is just incredible it's amazing and if there's one time piece that I will uh, purchase um, it would be that one um, having said that, you know, since if I had to choose, oh, it's so difficult because we get to see so many incredible, incredible timepieces, clearly in a very different way because we take them apart. Yeah, there's so much. There's so many beautiful timepieces out there. And the independents have really pushed that level. It's forced the big brands to to take note. I mean, they've done, mm -hmm. the big brands do amazing things too. But I think that the little guys at the beginning, nobody really took that much notice of them. And slowly these little guys were becoming stronger and stronger and more and more present in the market. And I I mean, I have been in Basel World um, exhibiting. And I remember at the time when um, we would be exhibiting and you would have designers <laughs> coming to view what we were presenting. And at the time, I remember thinking, uh, you are coming to get ideas. Mm. And these designers were not designers, you know, who were about to start up their own thing. They were designers from, from larger brands. Mm. And we did at one stage get a call from somebody saying, oh, my God, have you seen this watch? They've <laughs> pinched your style. It was kind of like a little, it was frustrating because it's so hard. It is so hard for the little guys. And at the time, you know, at the time there was no crowdfunding. There was no, none of that. And, you know, if you wanted to, to start building your watches, you literally had to make a prototype and uh, you had to beg. You had to beg the companies to even open the door to you to make a dial and uh, we had to knock on so many doors and we were turned away time and time again um, by different uh, manufacturers who just saw us as a nuisance <laughs> because we're, we were not going to buy uh, hundreds and thousands of anything. You know, the, I remember the very first set of dials that uh, that Peter and I had to order um, 
at the time when we were when we were just putting together the first collection and we had to sit there and and it was a minimum order which thankfully the the company had agreed i think it was like uh 15 15 enamel dials or 20 enamel dials and uh which is nothing but uh, for us that was huge and mm. uh, we had to sit there and go what are we going to make <laughs> <laughs> and we went through it and we had to really think about it because our budget was practically non-existent. Our budget was my salary because at the time mm. I was still working. I was working for a telephone company. Peter was working as a subcontractor for, um, you know, he was building uh, complications for other brands at the time. And it was his whatever he earned went straight into the company and whatever I earned fed us and any extra, you know, any bonuses or anything like that went straight into the company as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, it was a slow, slow, um, slow process. For us, it was absolutely vital that it was right. And we became known as this annoying couple that would call back and complain that a dial wasn't perfect and uh, or a case had um you know we were pretty strict on the criteria and uh, the number of companies that really just hated us <laughs> um because we would you know we would we would order these tiny amounts and we were so demanding and i remember once uh, our case maker at the time i can say it's the case maker because the the company is now doesn't exist anymore but it was run by these two old guys and who'd been in the industry and they made cases for everybody all the big brands and they'd send us these cases and they were scratched and i called them up and i basically said like uh, I'm sending them back and you're going to polish them properly and then uh, you'll send them back to us. And I remember they were, we were the last in the chain. I had to hound them so much to get our cases, to get anything. And um, these are old, old guys, old Swiss men. Okay. <laughs> okay. Old Swiss men that says something to you. A woman's place was not running a company and uh, I remember once picking up uh, he finally one of the, one of the, the partners picked up and, uh, and he said to me oh I'm surprised uh, to be hearing from you I'd expect you to be at home looking after your child oh, wow. and I just remember I was like I'm from London <laughs> this is not gonna <laughs> And I just said, never mind my child, where the hell are my cases? <laughs> <laughs> and it was just like, don't even go there. Being someone who's who's trying to start a brand now, uh, it, it's still challenging finding companies that are willing to, to work with someone who's interested in ordering 10 movements or, you know, 20 straps or something yeah. like that. But I, obviously the, the work that people like you and Peter and the other independents of the time, you certainly have opened the way for us to even make it possible. Uh, Peter introduced me to the folks at Swartz at Chen, and they've been wonderful to deal with, but they're the first people that have even been willing to speak to me, you know, at, at, about buying 10 movements versus, you know, people, everybody else wants to me to order a thousand movements or whatever. And yeah, it, it is challenging, but it's, uh, but it, it is absolutely because of the work that, uh, that folks like you did early on that uh, that have made it even possible for me to to consider doing this now, especially being out in the in the wilds of Canada and and not having access to to those sorts of industries. Yeah, and and I see I see I mean you can see the the difference today. Um, things that are being done today just were just didn't exist at the time. And I remember a journalist coming to us at the workshop. And interviewing Peter and posing the question, what happens now? You guys have opened, not just us, but, you know, this generation of watchmakers have opened up the floodgates. And Mm. I remember Peter's reply, which was, what will happen now is that 
there will be a sea of independents and smaller brands. And at some point, only the quality brands will remain. There will be a leveling out. And um, this was when, um, I mean, none of the, the crowdfunding, things like Chapek and um, all of these companies that have become very, very um, recognized companies today. But at the time when they started, it was completely revolutionary. And I remember Peter's answer to that question and thinking he's absolutely right. It is uh, It is now going to become a matter of um, there are going to be so many, but you're going to have people who are technically minded and then you're going to have people who are just putting it together to make it and, you know, make a brand and sell it. And there's that aspect as well. Mm. But at the time, uh, you know, at the time of uh, <laughs> of uh, Stepan, of us and uh, all the other small guys um, and the whole AHCI, I mean, they, every single person mm. there can give you an amazing story. Um, it was very much uh, make one, make one, then worry about making the second one. Um, <laughs> and... I remember um, I was at, because the HCI has their annual meeting at Basel World, because that's when everybody's together and going to, going there and sitting there. And of course you have Philippe Dufour, you've got Vianney Halta, you've got all of these, uh, these people there. And uh, we were sitting at the table with um, Urvik, uh, oh gosh, uh, Baumgartner, Felix, Felix Baumgartner was sitting at our table. And I'm sitting there and I've got my watch on because we're exhibiting. So I'm wearing a watch and um, I'm sitting there and Felix looks over at my wrist and he said, uh, is that a real watch? And I said, well, yes, of <laughs> course, it's a real watch. Um, and he was like, oh, my God, you've got an, ac you're an actual watch on your wrist. And he and uh, everybody would joke. That uh, he said, well, be careful because Peter may chop your hand off just to sell that watch. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, and everyone would be like, you've got a real watch. You know, no, I'm just wearing a prototype. Oh, no, I, I'm not even wearing a watch because, you know, I've got it in the, it's, it's all stock. There is no extra watch for me. And the first time I saw, um, yeah, we, I was at a friend's house and uh, Stepan was there. Um, and uh, I was wearing a watch. Stepan was there showing his uh, his prototype. And uh, it was, oh, let's have a look then. And my friend said, can I see your watch? And I said, sure, sure. And I handed her my watch. And she said, is it real? <laughs> and I said, yeah, it's real. And she said, oh, no, I just, I just asked because I saw the other day I saw, um, I saw a piece that was being presented that, you know, it was a prototype and the dial was actually just a piece of paper. <laughs> it was a piece of paper that had been printed and stuck inside just to get the, you know, to get the, uh, to the look of it. And she said, I didn't realize until he told me, no, no, that's just paper. Afterwards, it'll be an enamel and it'll be this. And uh, it was, it was hilarious. It was hilarious. The I don't feel so bad about having done that with my own watches. I've I've done the exact same thing. In fact, one of them, <laughs> I, I was over in the UK and I, I had been working on a case prototype and I actually just hand wrote the numbers on the dial. Um, you know, they weren't, it was just sort of a quick scribble with a Sharpie and uh, <laughs> people thought it was hilarious. But uh, sometimes that's what you have to do because you you want to get the experience yeah. of wearing the, the, the watch and seeing if it's right. And, but you, you need to, exactly you, know, you need to focus on the thing that you're working on. And that wasn't the dial at the time that I wore that watch. So yeah, you can't be printing or making like 10 different dials just to see which style, uh, which exactly. style it is. Um, so there are, there are little, little tricks of the trade. <laughs> it was, but it's, but these little stories are what made it fun at the time. It was a whole experience, um, the HCI, you know, meeting everybody there. I was, I was, um, I was actually talking to a journalist recently, um, Spanish journalist, and talking about, um, uh, do you know the brand Pita? 
um, based in Barcelona. I think they are a Spanish um, guy. Mm -hmm. And he was, he... Yeah, he's also part of the AHCI. Yes, that's right. And he exhibited uh, for the first time when we were also exhibiting. And, uh, of course, he doesn't speak English. Um, he only has like a few words of uh, of English. So I'd spend my time between my stand. And then mm -hmm. when I saw him struggling, I would I would uh, leave Peter and I'd go over and translate um, because I speak Spanish. I translate for Peter and uh, give him a hand. And then, of course, there's the German guys um, who were trying to talk to him and then they would come to me because I also speak German. And uh, <laughs> they would come to me and they would be asking me, Daniel, to say this, say this. And at one stage, oh, gosh, who was it? It was one of the clockmakers who um oh no it was yeah it was the 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 english clockmaker sinclair harding um mm. i can't remember his name he came up to me and it was the end of the fair and everyone you know it, everyone was beginning to relax and everyone was joking around with each other and uh uh robert robert bray comes up to me and he said daniel how do he said can you help me out i need i need you to write something in german for me and I was like, why not do you need something in German? And he said, I just need you to write, buy one, get one free. And I was like, <laughs> what? And he he literally, I, I wrote this down on a, a piece of A4, and he stuck it on one of the clocks that belonged to no. one of the German <laughs> The German clockmakers, and uh, I left it there until, of course, the guy noticed, and it was just it's such a funny, funny experience. So my life has been surrounded by watches and clocks. You were effectively the the chief executive officer of Speak Marin Watches, but Speak Marin is not the only watch brand that you've you've worked for. That's right. I also worked. Uh, I had a a short stint at Piaget, and that was um, that was an incredible experience <laughs> because until that time, I had done so much not to enter the watch industry uh, because, you know, in Lalak, you're a watchmaker or you're a watchmaker or you work in the watch industry in one way or another. <laughs> and right. I, I had come in from London working on the BBC and I had managed to uh, to get a job as a cosmetics planner. So in a cosmetics company that had just opened up in uh, Le Cré du Loc, uh, which is an American company, Mary Kay Cosmetics. And they needed a planner, a scheduler. And I, and I had applied as a scheduler because I was a scheduler at the BBC. They gave me a chance. I had literally just completed a three-month French language course um, because I needed to learn French. So I did an intensive three month course and uh, landed this job because I spoke English and French, uh, very bad French, but enough. And after that, um, I left that company and I ended up working uh, a few, well, for a little while uh, in the importing and exporting of timepieces in um, La Côte aux Fées for Piaget. Mm. They, have a, they have a facilities there. And uh, this, this facility is literally is the entire village. Um, and this was my first real uh, stepping in. I mean, besides living and breathing, uh, watchmaking and watches, uh, going every day into, you know, not every day, but going into Renault and Papi, being constantly surrounded by watchmakers who only speak watches. Um, mm. And uh, everything was watches, everything, absolutely everything. And it was great. But, you know, I had my own, my own identity, my own, I'm not, you know, my own career. And I would constantly say, no, I am not working for a watch brand. And <laughs> but slowly, you know, you live it. It's not it's not just a job. Yeah. Everything, everything. I can't begin to uh, explain. It's like you go to dinner and everybody is um, is in that industry. It's not like uh, you're the odd one out. It is um, very much a, a community 
and uh, La Locle, La Chaux-de-Fonds, all of these places, it's, it, it is a big, it is the industry. So it's not anything quirky. It just is. And mm. people's grandfathers, great-grandfathers, uncles, aunts, cousins, all work in the watch industry in one way or another. I was trying so hard not to. And uh, Piaget was just extraordinary because I really got to see a uh, a company other than Ren and Puppy. Ren and Puppy was making just brain-exploding uh, technical things. And Piaget was a very commercial company. It's commercial. They also did, you know, there's a jewelry. And uh, I got to see um, a whole new world, which was much more commercial, much more um, larger much larger because Renault and Papi were making, um, were not selling uh, pieces uh, in their, by, you know, were using their own name. So it was, it was extraordinary. It was uh, a really logistically, it was just fascinating the way all of the merchandise would move from one section of the world to the other. And that was my job. <laughs> I would be contacting <laughs> different um, retailers I would be matching matching the the sale to an available timepiece to try and reduce the the waiting time for the customer. So um I literally would be on the phone saying, Okay, you got that in according to my my list, you've got this timepiece, you've had it for quite a while. Are you interested in, you know, maybe exchanging it? And if they were, they'd I'd get it shipped back. That was my first experience with CITES. <laughs> uh, mm. Getting, I had a shipment of watches returned. I can't remember which country they were coming from, but uh, one day I get a phone call saying I've got a, a shipment of watches waiting at customs. The problem is that the the, the documents that for the straps aren't haven't been included, and just one little thing, you know, that tiny little detail that the person at the other end had missed. It's just like, just send me the watch head and the buckle, not the strap. Uh, and uh, and the whole thing got, uh, you know, got blocked at customs and we right. needed those timepieces. So I just had to get them cut off. <laughs> and I had to literally scrap all those, um, all those straps. And it's just like, oh, wow. cut them off, send me the, keep send them there. The yeah, yeah, send the heads and then you can keep the strap. And it was extraordinary and just seeing the whole process, the whole pro- and I, I remember going through the, the factory and being taken to the to the workshop and talking to the workshop manager and talking to um the different people that worked in the different departments and them showing me the archives. That blew my mind. It was just like this wall of ledgers and it's like a, yeah. Yes, everything has been noted down since the sale of uh, the first uh, timepiece. And it was just like, mm. oh, my God, that's incredible. <laughs> it was extraordinary. It really showed me a different a different world. It was very, very commercial. And the commercial side of it, I found uh, fascinating. And the whole, you know, it's a puzzle. It's a puzzle and you have to juggle a hundred things to make that one timepiece reach the store and then reach the final client. And that was it. After that, I was that I was an addict. <laughs> and it wasn't it was after that that I I, I actually found a a position working in a telephone company. That's when we we started um the time it was the watch the watch workshop and Mm. then when i joined officially we had to change the name because of swiss regulations and Mm. uh, because i was um, a it was a joint company 50 50 partnership um the swiss rules were that you have to have your name in it and it was just like oh I said, we can't have speak Marin and speak Marin. That's just going to sound dumb. <laughs> the very kind lady um, at the office basically said, listen, you can have uh, speak Marin and see, 
speak Marin and partner, speak Marin and uh, something else. And I and I was just like, okay, let's just go with speak Marin and partner. And that was the that what became the the company name and the the brand became Speak Marin. Um, and then after that, it became uh, Speak Marin SA. Once, uh, and that was when I left. Looking back in retrospect, it is just astounding how much things changed from that that early group of independents that you and, and Peter were on the scene with there in Switzerland. When you look back at your dinner with Phoebe Forzi, and she's excited, she has this this big news, and it was just this this small seed, this germ of what was to come. And you look at Group of Forzi now, and it, it is yeah. just massive, and even Kari Vosilainen. Like Votilan yeah. has become a, a veritable brand in its own right. Exactly. And you certainly shepherded Speak Marin through an incredible period of, of growth up through to 2009. And then in 2017, you shifted gears and, and you've launched the, the Naked Watchmaker Project, which has just shone a spotlight on so many areas of the industry that have otherwise been in the shadows. And this is something I, I've really appreciated about what you guys have done. And you've been able to unlock things that not even watchmakers within the brands would have access to like yeah. the Breguet pocket watch that, that you guys got access to. It's like, I, I think the reason that that all worked out was number one, your, your tenacity, which I, I think it has paid dividends for both the speak Marin brand, as well as the, the naked watchmaker project. So thank you for that. But I don't think that the brand itself being um, cautious, I suppose would be, or, or conservative would let one of their watchmakers touch this, but because you guys signed off on all the paperwork to, to, to be fully liable for for taking apart this timepiece, the, this treasured early Breguet that's worth millions of yeah. dollars. And you've also gone inside of companies like like Mimotech and RC Tritech with uh, who are the makers of Super Luminova. And you've been able to to unearth and show to the world what actually goes into making all these minute components that all have to come together to to deliver a finished product. Yeah, I have to say this is the most exciting job. Um, I could ever have dreamed of. And the thing was that, you know, this is, uh, for me, education has always been a really, really big thing. I, at one stage, when I finished university, I remember um, heading back from Germany, being at um, the port uh, with Peter and saying how I felt that I should go into teaching, but I just wasn't sure and into education, and I just wasn't 100% sure. And him saying to me, well, why don't you just try, give industry a try, and and you can always go into teaching later. And when this project started, I remember thinking, wow, this has a lot of me in this, because the the teaching and the, the sharing of the, the knowledge is something that I've it's always been you know, I've been very passionate about that. Uh, it, equally, Peter, huh, he has also been very uh, passionate about sharing uh, sharing this knowledge. And it's it's an extraordinary it's an extraordinary project that just doesn't exist elsewhere. I have to say, uh, you know, the the Breguet Pocket Watch. We asked, and they said no, <laughs> outright. <laughs> no, they didn't even breathe. They just said <laughs> no. I get it. And, uh, you know, it's not going to happen. And we didn't push it because it was early. It was really early. And it was thanks to the amazing job that Peter did with those early uh, deconstructions. Emmanuel Breguet, he Mm. was really moved by by the deconstructions, by Peter's photography. Mm. I have to say to you that the, the, the deconstructions, and it's not just me blowing my whistle but Peter's a watchmaker and he does talk watchmaking a lot of the times it's very it's he forgets that other people just are not watchmakers so the deconstruction is a draft first I'd like to say first draft but I ask him to go through it like at least four times before I get to touch it and at that point we go through it together and I make sure that the Things are understood, that things are clear, that little things, um, you know, that maybe Peter's like, yeah, but it's there. And I was like, yeah, but, you know, you see that, but I see it differently. And I'm pretty sure that somebody who doesn't understand won't necessarily get that point. 
So these deconstructions are really uh, are a labor of love and and arguments as well mm. because there's a lot of like no, this is clear and, I, and I'm having to say it's clear to you because you're a watchmaker, but mm -hmm. our public's our public is not a bunch of watchmakers, and so there's a lot of back and forth and. It's a process. I don't see it as arguments. I see it as a process. This is the process, how we get to the deconstructions, how we get to making it as clear as possible. And the amazing, um, I mean, the, the deconstructions we did for Breguet were huge. It was a huge mm. uh, project. And when we did the um, subscription uh, and we sent it off for them to see it, um, we got a... Uh, we got a handwritten letter from Emmanuel. Mm. He was just so moved by that to deconstruction. And that was the moment where they they said yes. And mm -hmm. in the letter he says, you know, you guys have done such a great job. We're going to let you uh, put, get your hands on, the, on this watch. <laughs> <laughs> and we were just bouncing off the walls i cannot tell you and i was so excited uh I, up until that point i had been to the breguet factory for uh, an article that we were doing on enamel and so i'd visited the factory and everything but that day that day when we went there to really be uh, to get started on that deconstruction was just extraordinary and uh, this watch coming into the room with a security person and, um, you know, <laughs> a file of papers that I had to sign, you know, I'm absolutely shaking and saying, uh, saying to Peter, you know, for God's sake, don't break it. I mean, if anyone can fix it, it's Peter. He's fixed so many different antiques. I mean, made components because they just don't exist. Uh, and, you know, when he was in London, the, the the restoration that he did, he he was working for the big auction houses. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, some big companies uh, that uh, we, I can't mention, um, but also coming to, uh, to us basically because they didn't have anybody who could, uh, who could uh, fix a watch, uh, a particular watch. I mean, we've had watches be delivered uh, in a case that is, is literally chained to, the person who's delivering it mm -hmm. and the person stands there and uh, you know there's all sorts of id processes that go through that that's the the level of um, of skill and and trust that the industry has in uh, in peter's ability so i i was um confident but you know accidents can happen and, uh, you don't want to have to go to, to Breguet and say, can I borrow a lathe to make a new balance staff? Exactly. That's not the sort of conversation you want to have at, at any point with that uh, that deconstruction. Exactly. But the great thing was that there was a small, it was in a, a, this room and there were a few people there. And it's in a, um, a little container that, um, you know, that protects it. And uh, Peter says, do you want to hold it? I'm just like, No. <laughs> I'll just look from here. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, no, no, I don't even want to breathe on this thing. But it was amazing, amazing just to be in the same room. Mm -hmm. And I did actually film him starting to take it apart, but uh, I was being annoying. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, will you stop that? And uh, I stopped filming. And I wish I had just ignored him and just filmed it because it really was a historical historical moment mm, absolutely but that that piece in itself is was just extraordinary and that piece has opened the door to so many others because one of the things i mean and it is really hard to get into these companies and it's not a matter of us you know knocking on the door and saying hey can we take one of your watches apart for example with the with the japanese the japanese uh, seiko it took took me six months and i think it took five no's yeah, I think five times they said no to me. So that's the way I work. It's not a matter of they said yes or no. It's how many times they say no to me <laughs> before, before they say yes. 
they give up <laughs> and they'll say and they say yes and, and the Japanese were great and they were very respectful and you know thank you very much thank you very much and I hounded them and I sent them articles about education and in the end they they said yes we agree we you know it is important to spend time to educate the public as to um, the workings of timepieces. And uh, we were so grateful because whether you like them or not, Seiko has a place in history. Absolutely. Some of the things they do, I mean, Grand Seiko and Credor is just extraordinary. It was, And it's amazing to have those timepieces on on the website. And I remember when we put some of the pictures up, I remember on the social media, someone, I would put a picture up and um, the comments were like, wow, I was not expecting that. And it's, and that's such a great comment and such mm. a great reaction to have from somebody, you know, to see inside and actually be, just be surprised, be thrilled and and just, I mean, if you look at the uh, Ferdinand Bertu uh, deconstruction, that mm -hmm. one is jaw dropping. That that one just really still blows my mind. It's just so beautiful. And Blancpain, we were very surprised with Blancpain because it was just like oh, a big swatch group. You know what? It's going to be just what interesting timepiece. You know, to really really show something different. And uh, when Peter was showing me the pictures, I was like, oh my. Goodness, look at this. I, I would never have expected that. And uh, now it's one of my favorites, the, mm. uh, the, 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 whole, the whole thing. I mean, and if you look at the Blancpain X Fathoms, we have a picture of the components on a chair. And the components are on the floor and then they're on the seat of the chair and then the tower goes up. And these are the components that make up one watch. Mm -hmm. And it's just when you put it that way, it's just extraordinary. But um, getting into into different places is is hard. Uh, Kosk. Kosk is is put together by different cantons. So for mm -hmm. us to go in there and photograph and do what we did, they had a meeting. I mean, they have meetings, but that's where they discuss these things. And in the meeting, they uh, the, the, the order of, thankfully, it was just the right time. The order of the day was, you know, all of their business, and would we be allowed to go in and uh, photograph and share? Thankfully, um, they were all very open-minded, and uh, they were like, yes, we could. And we got a phone call saying, yes, it has been approved. You can come in. And that in itself was, again, extraordinary. It's knocking on people's doors and, and convincing mm -hmm. them that we're not here to make anyone look bad. We just want to share this mm. amazing, amazing uh, skill and aspect that just people don't realize that goes on in the background. Well, I think a lot of people who are in the industry don't really appreciate the privileged position they're in to be able to see the insides of these watches and see what's going on. And outside of, you know, us watchmakers, most times the insides of these watches are never seen by anyone else. So this really does give the the rest of the world a privileged look inside of of the the mechanisms as well as uh in some cases how they're how they're actually being made so it, it really is nice to to get that access and i i don't know that there are very many very many other people who could get that uh get that access we're very fortunate and we're very stubborn <laughs> <laughs> and we just keep we keep knocking i actually have to tell you a little story that, that we had um one brand that i was trying to get uh get through to and of course most uh, it's always no so at one stage we get a phone call in fact peter got the phone call the guy said i, I simply had to meet you um because everyone has been talking to me about you about the naked mm -hmm. watchmaker peter said ah yes he said that's not actually not me <laughs> <laughs> he said that's daniela she is like a you know like a dog with bones she's just well, he's not going to give up and what I had done is that I had contacted every single person in the company <laughs> and asked them to mention the naked watchmaker to him <laughs> to the point where he was just like, all right, I will speak with you. So 
It was fun. And he said, uh, Peter said, I, I don't deal with any of the social media. I do the, I do the, the deconstruction, the photography, um, that side. And, and he said, all of the, all of the, the social media and that aspect is, is, uh, is Daniela. And, and I have some help also, clearly. The, the fun thing was that, um, you know, I had had the no, no, no. And he was not going to answer my messages. And uh, in the end, he was the one that called us, which was fun. <laughs> so you have to persevere. If you want to do something, you have to persevere. Well, I am incredibly grateful for your, for your perseverance. Having never been in, inside Cosk and a number of these other places, it, it's I really appreciate being able to see uh, a number of the photos that you guys have been able to, to publish and the information you've been able to bring to light. And the same with Schwartz ATN. And as well, you guys have one of the best deconstructions or most thorough re- deconstructions of Philippe Dufour's simplicity that is out there on the market. And Dufour's simplicity today is selling for about the same amount as, as that Breguet, priceless Breguet pocket watch that, that you guys got access to. So being able to see inside of a, a timepiece like that and the impeccable level of finishing that Dufour lends to his movements, it's just so beautifully captured. So thank you for that as well. Oh, we have to thank Philippe for that because he was very, very, very good, you know, to actually acquiesce star. And that one was an easier one because, you know, we know Philip, so yes, but yeah, he yeah. could have said no, but he didn't. He was he was really good and let us do that. And he's you know, he's been a, an amazing he's been an amazing um part of our lives because he was all those years ago to get into the HCI you have to have two uh Bahan, they are the people that sponsor you to become mm-hmm. to go into the into the HCI and uh, Philippe saw uh, Peter's pocket watch. It was he went to Basel with it. Case Engelbart actually said, "I'm going to Basel. Why don't you come and show your watch around?" And he said, "You got to see these guys at the HCI." So I think it was Case uh, took Peter, and uh, Peter at the time was just marvelled by all of the timepieces that were there and the watchmakers that were there and meeting Philippe and Case said, hey, Peter, you're here to show your watch. <laughs> show him <laughs> your watch. Um, so Peter Schoen gets out the pocket watch and shows it to Philippe and Philippe was just like, well, and he said, you you should be here with us. I think it was Philippe and I can't remember who, he, I think it was Vianney was his or uh, his, or that, but I could be mistaken with that one. But Philippe was definitely one of them and he was the one that uh, recommended him to the HCI. And, mm. and so that was a, that was a big thing. So, and having his timepiece there is, uh, is just right. It should be oh, there. Absolutely. The absolutely. world should see his work. He's a, he is an incredible, incredible guy and a lovely guy. I have to say there are, it's a really, really nice person who's very open. I'm absolutely delighted that he's getting the credit he should. Mm-hmm. The funny thing is, at the beginning, you know, we would, we would go to these barbecues. Um, uh, Philip would be there, and all, this, and it would be like nobody knows in Switzerland. Nobody knew who <laughs> Philip was, and uh, uh, you know, in Japan they knew who he was, but people didn't know who he was. And you know, the good thing is that that's great, but at the same time, the the timepieces that he has made that have gone under auction afterwards, it's not Philip who's making the money. So it's kind of a, from that side, I just, I'm really happy that, that now, you know, his timepieces are, are reaching the levels and, and that that's going, you know, that he's also benefiting from that. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's great to see him now passing on his, his skill and his knowledge to, to his, his own daughter, Daniela. And uh, seeing her carry that, yeah. that torch on as well. Yeah, it gets confusing when we actually have dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. There's a lot of uh, the whole Daniela thing is, it, it gets confusing. <laughs> but yes, Daniela, she's she's an incredible young lady. And um, mm-hmm. it's funny because I, I was just talking to Peter recently and I was saying how I'm going to be giving her a call soon because I want to interview her for our club. Mm-hmm. Questions. Awesome. I hope to be doing more, a few more things uh, with uh, with them in the future. I don't want to say what yet because they haven't said yes. 
<laughs> and it would be wrong <laughs> would be wrong to do that. Yeah, she's she's extraordinary. She's extraordinary and I and it's and it's great that he has you know, that he has that support. Philippe and these independents, it's not it's not big companies. These people work on their own, maybe with one other person. Uh, it tends to be family businesses. The the passing on of that knowledge and the passing on of that that heritage ultimately is uh, is a really important thing. I can not agree more. Now, earlier this past autumn, you and Peter launched the Naked Watchmaker Master Class, with the chief ambition being to d- dispel myths and uh, just help perpetuate uh, a deeper knowledge of mechanical watchmaking. How has that been going? We did. It's it's going well, and we're actually currently working on the second course, which will be coming up uh, coming up next year. We this is one of the things that was always on the cards with the uh, Naked Watchmaker, the education. And it comes from the fact that we, having had our own brand, came across uh, a lot of uh, sales staff, a lot of uh, collectors, a lot of uh, people who love watches, but don't necessarily understand how they work. Then with the Naked Watchmaker, there's been a lot of uh, social media work. And that's been eye-opening to say the least to see some some of the things in the comments that are made in these different groups and uh, talking to the different journalists and uh, different people who work um very much online uh, the the frustration of of uh, people just giving up on correcting misinformation and i mean i i could tell you so many different journalists saying i i don't bother anymore <laughs> there's just no point um, because one opinion goes over another opinion, and and uh, and I, I've you know you see it. There's a lot of good stuff out there, and there's a lot of dodgy stuff out there. One of the things we wanted to do is to just get the basics. Start. We'll start with the basics, and then really have a place where people can go, and they can say, "Okay, I want to learn about this. This information is coming from." People who have actually worked in the industry from a watchmaker, from a place of knowledge and not a place of, I really like watches. I'm going to set up my YouTube channel, Mm. my TikTok account and my Instagram and my whatever else there is these days and really provide a, a place where the information and not just this is how it ticks but a much broader a much broader um, education looking at the history looking at the evolution looking at uh, uh, certain things like you know what are the changes that that brought about uh, the wristwatch as it is today these elements which are part of the part of the knowledge that are important if you want to really get into this hobby, uh, if you want to really develop, you can spend a lot of money on books and at the end of it, really not understand what you've just read. That What we wanted to do was to have a place where we could present the information, but also to have the backup that we are here. If you don't understand the course, if you don't understand an, an element of the course, you have somewhere you can pose a question. And if there's anything, you know, you have any doubt, the student can send us an email and say, okay, this point here I didn't quite get. Or can you explain this or this element? Why Why is this? And we can rephrase it if we need to. And if it'll be clear. If we get the same question five times, then we need to... Mm. We need to make a change so it's better worded. But we've had also some really pertinent uh, questions, which we are now putting together. And as we go through these different questions, if if we feel that um, this is a question which is being posed, which is a good question, maybe that somebody else didn't think of, but we will also contact the students who have taken the course and say, hey, these are the questions that were posed. Maybe this additional uh, information will also bring you something. So we will constantly be uh, updating and keeping people informed. 
it's been a great process. Clearly, it was uh, we had to learn a lot about about recording, etc. Uh, funnily enough, for me coming from radio hmm. all those years ago, uh, but um, putting together the course, simplifying it because you know this the foundation course is for anyone. But the most important thing is that the foundations are solid because the next courses will be a lot more um, detailed. We intend going through every complication and in a lot of detail. Well, one of the nice things about this course is that the, all of this information is out there. It, it's available to anybody on the internet who who wants to try and find this stuff, but it's when you're digging around for this on your own, it's very difficult to figure out what's important, what isn't important, what is correct and not correct. And it's nice that you have created this concise resource that has both great technical information in it as well as um, more layperson understanding of it as well. You, I was um, I was listening to one of the uh, one of the sort of podcasts with uh, with my wife who unfortunately for her, has to listen to me talk about watchmaking all the time. So she's been sort of absorbing a lot of watchmaking. But we both really enjoyed the fact that the two of you were talking in this, you know, in this this uh, course. And you can approach it from each of your strengths. And, you know, you could rein Peter in sometimes when he was getting off on a tangent or ask him to explain it in a different way. And that that was extremely powerful. And it was nice to have that that sort of that balance between both the technical and the person who's used to sort of needing to explain this to non-technical people as well. So it, it is really a great course from that point of view. Thank you. Thank you. It really was a it was an evolution. huh? At the beginning, we had uh, I mean, literally we started this uh, months ago. <laughs> um, COVID has been helpful in, in helping us advance. Putting it together, uh, Peter was very excited about doing a course, but you know, a watchmaker giving a course is is intense, um, to mm. say the least, and it it revolved around him giving an explanation, and that was it. And it was just like the, we we sat down and I restructured. I restructured. I basically looked at it and I said, this this is not going to work like this. We have to interject different aspects. And also we have to approach it from this angle. Thankfully, when I was running um, our old company, uh, one of the things that I did was I wanted our, our staff, our non-technical staff to understand. So at the time, Worstep had a course specifically for people who worked in the industry, but were non-technical. So I went off and did it because I wanted our team to do it. And this was a mm. very, very expensive course. <laughs> and so, you know, if I'm going to pay, I don't know, I can't remember how much it was. I think it was like 3,000 Swiss francs or so, uh, something like that uh, course. If I'm going to pay that for each one of my staff, I'm going to make sure it's the right course. And I went and I did this course and I remember sitting through some of it thinking this is just completely unnecessary to my daily working it's great because i wanted to know but some aspects were fantastic were just exactly pitched at the right to uh, the right way the other there was it went into uh, for me a bit too much a uh, detail for non self you do not know, need to know the calculations to be able to you know cut out a wheel I don't need to know that to understand how the watch works. Mm. But it was done from a watchmaker's perspective. I mean, I really enjoyed the course. It was great. And when we sat down to go over the course, I basically pulled from that experience and from the experience of like, what, what the information I want to to put forward to and who do I want to put it forward to. I wanted this to be really for for anybody, even if you know a lot of this stuff. It will, you, will still bring you something. It will still help you bring all of those bits of knowledge together to to build a, a greater picture of the industry. 
And one of the things that happened at the very beginning of The Naked Watchmaker was that I had my niece go through the site. And I mm. said, listen, I just want to make sure that it's not too technical. You know nothing about watches. <laughs> and she's just like, what's a watch? <laughs> uh, and she's very much a, oh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a jewelry. It's just a jewelry. If you want to read at the time, I have my my iPhone. I've got my pod, my telephone. I've got my all electronics. And uh, so for her, what I do is just mind blowing. And she said, yes, yes, I'll take a look. And she uh, came back with a very pertinent comment, which was, this, this is great, but I don't know how watches work. So mm. I love the articles, but I don't know how this watch ticks. I don't know what makes it tick, and I, and I don't understand how it works. And she says, if you could put something together so I can, I can begin to understand the basics, I'll understand your articles better. And at that point, it was just like, it's coming. You're just going to have to wait a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's been great. It's been great. And I think that the, the um, for us, it was fun to put it together. And I have to say, it was a learning process. We got into the swing of it after a while. There were a lot of uh, different takes. Um, but I think we've got our we've got our formula now. Um, there will be changes in the future. And as I said, we're working on the next one. We so understanding tourbillons is the next one. And we're busy, busy bees getting um, all of the material and interviewing people that we will be, um, we have going to have a lot more video material. But the most important thing is you have to start at this, you know, you have to start at the beginning. And this course um, is a fun way to really take those first steps. Yeah, fun is a great way. To put it, because I really like the the joviality that you yourself bring to the Naked Watchmaker Masterclass. It's very clear you and, and Peter have some chemistry together. I appreciated the life that that chemistry yeah. brought to some of the content that could otherwise have felt quite dry. Yeah. <laughs> the funny thing was that it really did start with, the, we did the first the first take and Peter was being very serious. And uh, at the end of it, and I, and I was just, just try and keep it simple. And uh, at the end of it, uh, he says to me, uh, he says, oh, you, you know, you got to, you're, you're, you're a little bit monotone. You could, you could talk a little bit, uh, you know, put a little bit of life into it or I don't know. And I just, my natural reaction was just to say to him, I'm sorry, you, you put me into a coma. So, <laughs> <laughs> and you look, and we both burst out laughing and it was just like, okay, this has to be, this has to be more relaxed because if I'm falling asleep, you know, there, there is no hope for this. So, so at that point, we realized that we had to, we had to keep it humorous, keep that, make it light and keep the, the, the humorous element because it is a very dry subject sometimes. Mm. And, and the whole point is to bring people in, you know, this is a fun thing and uh, it should be, it should be interesting. It should be a fun thing, you know, sit down, grab yourself a cup of tea and uh, and do your course and enjoy it. So I'm glad I'm glad the humor has come through and, and that uh, it works. That certainly helps and it will certainly help attract people who are not necessarily already deep in this this world. And I, I spend a lot of time watching YouTube videos and and it's interesting when I again, when I, I see the ones that, that my wife Tamara are willing to sit through because they have that humor and they have that relaxed sort of nature in the way that they're presenting the material. And it's really unimportant that the material is there or what it is. It's just that the, the delivery is well done. And that that's really challenging to do. It's difficult to have that chemistry. And, and fortunately, you have that. And, and I'm really happy that you've included it in this. And, uh, and it, it certainly does make a difference. Fantastic. Thank you. So, Tourbillons, the next uh, the next module. When uh, when do you think we can uh, we can expect to hear that? Is that going to be sort of late twenty twenty two, or is that is that maybe the schedule you're going to go on? Maybe on a yearly basis, be able to bring out a new module. We are trying to get it ready for the first half of twenty twenty two. We're very dependent on company schedules because. This is very specific, and we mm. do have tourbillons on the website that we can pull 
information, you know, pull the material. But there are so many different versions um, today, and we want to be able to show as many, uh, if not all, um, the existing uh, torpions that there that there are out there. And we like to have our own material. We like to have uh, original right. material and not just you know, a photograph that's been taken by the, the company because it will have been taken from an angle and from a perspective that is to sell the watch, whereas we, we want to explain. Mm -hmm. And so we are knocking on doors again, uh, trying to to get uh, companies to let us in and, and photograph. And of course, end of year is nearly impossible. Mm. We are now uh, waiting for companies to, uh, well, they're about, to close um but again to open up next year and to let us in a lot of them to you know to persuade them that it's it's good to educate the public on things that maybe are in a draw they're not promoting <laughs> they're probably mm. not going to sell <laughs> for a while but wouldn't it be great to <laughs> To share that with the public, a public that, that loves watches. Once we have the material uh, collated, we'll be able to, to start. But it's, um, we want, what we want to do is we, we also in this section, we want to include video footage of prominent, um, figures in the industry giving us their uh, on Torbion. So maybe we'll introduce you to people that you've never heard of, but mm. who are really, respected in the industry mm. and maybe you will uh, have the opportunity to hear a few uh, a few living legends have a little uh, five <laughs> minute chat about uh, what Torbians means to them not to tip your hand but will Vincent Calabrese be a, among those interviewed for the, the Torbion module we're gonna try and get absolutely everybody <laughs> <laughs> that sounds fantastic wonderful we're setting the the bar really high in we're going to knock on every single door and every single technical person um, that that we know, um, because um, as Peter and I were discussing this, there are people who are really instrumental in the development of these timepieces that you rarely hear of. If you're really in the industry, you will have heard of some of these people, but others you won't have. And they are, um, they're important. They're an important part. You could have CEOs and all of these people, but the problem with having CEOs talk about Torbians is that that CEO may not be the CEO of that company for long. Mm -hmm. I'm not here to promote CEOs as nice as they are and important because they're the ones that let us in. Mm -hmm. But what I want to do is to show that the the technical aspect and the technicians are there, the the watchmakers, the the uh, people who work in the R and D, they are there and they stay there, um, and they're the ones that we want to put forward and introduce you to, and and get their get their uh, take on this, um, mm -hmm. and there will be there will be people you will have heard of. Uh, just yesterday, we we interviewed uh, Michel Parmigiani. Mm -hmm. When we come back from, you know, after the holidays, uh, it will be full on uh, visiting the brand, uh, the companies, and uh, start recording, for the, uh, photographing, and getting uh, getting that next course started. But there's going to be a lot of um, different type of material. This is one one subject. The first course that we did really was uh, and is very broad because we had to get to the point where wristwatches exist mm -hmm. before we get to explaining to you what Torbion is uh, and the different types that there are. So that the first course has taken so long to put together because there was so much to so much to present and also you know we didn't want to we didn't want to drown the the listener with uh, too much information 
Uh, we had uh, the the good thing is that we do know a lot of people, and one of the things that I really was uh, wanted to do was to make sure that you know we had enough history um, that we covered the, the the main steps in the history, the the evolution. I have to say a big thank you to uh, Dr. Rebecca Struthers, who I sent a quick email to and saying, "Listen, can you, amongst everything else that you're doing, running a company and <laughs> and everything else, any chance you could listen to this?" And she, and she was just like, oh, I think I'll be available in a couple of months. Of course, it was just like, hmm, when do you need it for? Um, <laughs> next week? <laughs> and uh, and she was great. She was great. She gave it a, a quick view and gave us her feedback, uh, which was brilliant. And she, she's, uh, she is a historian as well as a, a watchmaker. So that was, that was epic. We are drawing on all of the resources, which we are very, very fortunate to have in this area. Well, I'm, I'm heartened to hear that you'll be drawing on all, all of your resources, because just given just a few of the names you, you've dropped over the course of this episode, it, it'll be absolutely fantastic. I'm very much looking forward to, to being able to take this in. Well, we are definitely knocking on every door that we know we can knock on. And even those mm. that we, you know, we know that they will say no, but how many times can they say no until they say yes? <laughs> <laughs> they just have to say yes once. That's all. Exactly. I already have the no. So you, you know, you have to, you have to try. You have to try. And, and I think that now is easier because now we've got the website. We've got all of these amazing brands that we have been so fortunate to cover. We've got the first course and they have seen the amount of social media work that we do. We're four years down the line. Mm -hmm. So, you know, knocking on a door when you've got all of this is very different to knocking on a door and saying, yeah, we've got this idea. Uh, nothing yet, but, you know, it's going to be great. <laughs> and uh, hoping somebody will will actually say, you know what? Uh, well, yeah, let's let's do that. This sounds like a good idea. Today the idea is uh, is alive and it's uh, it's doing amazing things and we we are dependent on on the brands and uh, people actually loving this project and and saying to us that uh, they're they're willing to to take a risk. I mean, I give you an example. We've got a deconstruction right now, which is um, something we've not done before. <laughs> some people will love it. Some people will hate it. One of the things that uh, we have to uh, to show the inside is that uh, we're going to have to break something. It's going to be a System 51? I can't say what it is. That's fair enough. Um, but anyway, I um, it was just like, now I have to. Um, it was like, oh, it's, it's, and everyone's like, oh, it's fine. It's fine. Looks good. And I'm just like, no, we need, we need to, we need to see inside. I'm sorry. Hmm. <laughs> It's been great because uh, the the brand has been the the, the watchmakers were like no <laughs> no <laughs> and uh, then I go back and I say well you know that's watchmaker talk but if you're not a watchmaker you're gonna want to see really you're gonna want to see inside after discussion it's been agreed mm. so. It's, you know, it is a matter of uh, looking at things from another angle and just trying, just trying, just keep trying and to show, to show that there's, there is so much in this industry that there will always be something that somebody doesn't like. You know, we're here to show all of the bits, all of the bits that, that build the industry. And uh, thankfully, because of all of our experiences, um, we do know an awful lot of people. We've been around long enough to for them to know that uh, we the, the intentions are good, and the intention is to to help people grow with this uh, with this passion, just like yourselves and what you do. Well, I for one certainly appreciate the the perspective that you bring to the table. And I'm incredibly grateful for your passion and your perseverance in being able to take as many no's as you have over the years and shine a light on things that just simply haven't been brought to the fore in the past. Mm -hmm. That The industry owes you a, a great debt. So for anyone who's interested in checking out the, the masterclass, where can they, they find out more about this? 
If you go to the Naked Watchmaker website, there is at the top bar, there is the menu has a section which is masterclass. Uh, and if you click on there, that'll take you straight to the masterclass section. And we'll be sure to have a, a link to that in our show notes. And we'll be sure to, to link as well to uh, another conversation you had recently, both uh, you and Peter together speaking with uh, Jeremy over at uh, the Oster Watches podcast. So uh, if you, dear listener, would like to hear both Daniela and Peter speak to what they've been up to with the Naked Watchmaker Project and uh, the new masterclass, you can certainly check that out. Thanks for listening to Off Hours. You can find detailed show notes at offhours.show. If you'd like to keep up to date with the show, follow us on Twitter at Off Hours. John can be found on Twitter at Under the Loop, and Chris can be found on Twitter and Instagram at Silver underscore Hand. <laughs>